and gentlemen, welcome to the Medevac Podcast. My name is Christian Myers, and I'm one of your hosts today, joined by David Reed. Yes, right, and right we have an awesome guest today, mm-hmm. Who do former SEAC John Wayne Troxel. You guys are digging deep to find guests, aren't you? That's John you, was you, a manly <laughs> name. First of all, so first, the first 146 people didn't want to do the podcast, so then you came to me. Is that I it, just, brother? You know, we had to go <laughs> back with an up, enlisted back up. character. <laughs> 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 so. So first and foremost, tell us what a SEAC is. So uh, uh, the SEAC is the senior enlisted advisor to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and is the senior enlisted person in the Department of Defense. The hierarchy of the Department of Defense, you have a Secretary of Defense, Mm -hmm. you have the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Collectively, those two provide best military advice to the President of the United States Mm -hmm. on the use of the military. And uh, the SEAC is the advisor to both of those gentlemen on all things related to the troops and all of the services. Okay. So, so what, what years were you? Uh, 2015, December to 2019, December. Hmm. So How many years of service was that to get to that position? Uh, I came in with 34 and I retired with 38. 38 years. Damn. 20 years as a sergeant major. Oh, that's that is awesome. <laughs> Incredible. So Please, so I'm an old bastard. The big, you know? Biggest swing in enlisted dick. In the military. Yeah. yeah and, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and you had some like pretty, pretty interesting stories within, you know, your time as a SEAC. I remember the, the old entrenching tool story. Yeah. So let's hear a little bit about At that. E-Tool Nation. Like, yeah. Let's, let's, yeah. let's, uh, and why, yeah, why E-Tool Nation came out of this. Yeah. So, yeah. So let's talk about E-Tool Nation here. But when I came into the Pentagon, you know, I had served in, in U.S. Forces Korea, you know, focusing on maintaining armistice conditions between North and South Korea, but a Mm. combat focus. I was the Sergeant Major of all combat forces in Afghanistan at the ISAF Joint Command. You know, when uh, you had your unfortunate incident of getting wounded and everything, Mm. and I'm sure we'll talk about that. And uh, and then I was in a Brigade Sergeant Major in the Surge Brigade. So my whole career, I had been a leader. My whole career as a sergeant major, I had been a leader focused on combat readiness mm. and being able to fight and win on any given day. And when I took over the job of the SEAC, I noticed in Washington, D.C. that there wasn't the right emphasis that I mm. thought that should have been uh, on fighting and winning. Now, this the first year I was in the job was under the Obama administration. Okay. And so— uh, um, I was getting a little frustrated that, you know, when people were talking about things like uh, jobs programs for foreign terrorist fighters in Syria and Iraq, when those foreign terrorist fighters generally aren't born out of poverty. Mm-hmm. Uh, they come from places like Germany, Belgium, France, places like that, and they are radicalized by the ide- ideology. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. Uh, terrorists in Somalia, Christian, where you've, you know, done some time at— those are born there, social yeah. economic issues drive people to be terrorists, you know. Yes. But for the vast majority of those foreign terrorist fighters, there weren't. And when I started hearing stuff like that, I thought we're going down a road that we shouldn't be going down. Mm. Then in January 2017, you know, we President Trump got sworn in, and shortly after, uh, Secretary Mattis got sworn in. Yeah. And uh, you know, Mattis came to me and he said, "Hey, we're not going to talk about just defeating the threats to the United States. Now we are going to annihilate them." Mm. If they want a shot at the title, we will annihilate them. Very powerful. Nowadays, I feel like you can't even say that without Yeah, yeah. and you off. guys know at even the tactical level, when leader. you hear words like that, it fuels you. It does. Yeah. If you're in Afghanistan, That's you're in you Somalia, where you're oh, at, yeah. you want to hear that kind of stuff. That's what you need. You absolutely need people to you know, to annihilate the enemy. I mean, yeah. that's our job when you go in there overseas. It's yeah. Not, you know, we're not here. You know, I, I love this term hearts and minds all the time, and that's an important aspect of yeah. things. You know, and we have to, you know, we have to be cognizant of that to be successful yeah. as a country, especially if we're going in. But, but annihilate the enemy should be the number one word. On Absolutely. Your that takes Absolutely. a very specific type of person to be able to come up with something like that too, yeah. right? You're not getting run of the mill individuals who are making these giant decisions and using words like, yeah. we will annihilate you or yeah. we will kill you with a fucking e So, At the end of the yeah. day, do we, do we want, you know, soldiers who, who are worried about, more, more worried about their, you know, their surgeries that they could, you know, do changes or whatever? Yeah. Like, no, we want, we want someone who's a tank that could go in there and do that. I want to yeah. get in front of the enemy and someone be like, 
that guy, I do not want to fight right now. Yeah. You know? yep. so, that- so it doesn't make you a xenophobe if you are studying the Chinese military or the Russian military and figuring out ways that you can gain competitive advantages and ultimately defeat those threats because they are the number one threats number one nation state threats to the you know freedom and I think it would be entirely the, the opposite at, yeah. in in that in that aspect i mean yeah. talking about xenophobia with yeah. studying something like that i don't think that's applicable yeah, I, mean, I think it's hey think so you you asked about e tool yeah. nation so yeah. i just uh so that the young troops could understand what the secretary was trying to say with the new national defense strategy mm-hmm. and with annihilate the enemy I had to, I wanted to break it down into terms, yeah, and I wanted to send a message to ISIS in particular, who was continuing to do things around the world. And I just said, "Hey, ISIS has two options: they can surrender or die. And if they surrender, we're a peace-loving nation. We'll treat them humanely, and we'll uh, escort them to their detainee holding facility cells, give them chow, and due process. Mm. But if they choose not to surrender, then we are going to kill them with extreme prejudice." whether that's dropping bombs on them, shooting them in the face, or in the end, beating them to death with our entrenching tools. But the bottom line, we will not (laughs) succumb to terrorists. And I think the message goes the same to any nation state that wants a shot at the title of, uh, you know, fucking with the sovereignty of the United States of America and our partners and allies. And and how is that, first of all, how is that message received to the troops that you were speaking in front of? Well, it was phenomenal. You know, as a leader, you guys know, I think the two most important things you can do outside of preparing your men and women for combat and fighting and winning is inspiring them. Yeah. So inspire the troops and along the way, intimidate the enemy. Yes. And after I said this, you know, ISIS went on their French propaganda webpage and started talking smack about me that, (laughs) you know, about, uh, you know, little, little John Wayne Troxel and his shovels doesn't intimidate us. us. Well, when you, you know, it's like a UFC fighter (laughs) that gets hit in the face and they smile. Well, that hurt. That's why they're smiling. So it it pissed off ISIS a little bit. And I started receiving death threats, you know, from Mm. both in the States and outside. But in the end, I was myself, right? I came (laughs) in. But, uh, you know, the troops loved it. And, and what really, you know, kind of confused me though, was that as much as the administration, Secretary Mattis and General Dunford loved what I was saying, mm. and the troops loved it. There were naysayers in Washington, D.C. So you received quite a bit of flack from that. I did. Yeah. And, and it started down a road uh, where people wanted to do professional harm to me. Mm. And in the end, I was— uh, And your peers as well. I mean, absolutely. Your yeah. peers were going after you. And, yeah. And, and so what was the reasoning behind it? They have to have a, you know, a logical reason. Professional behind. jealousy is one— the other thing they is— They can't say that to you. They can't be like, I'm professionally jealous. No, they, but so you, they have to come at you in other avenues. Well, they of, say, you know, and I couldn't believe some of this. An enlisted person is meant to be seen and not heard. Yeah. And the person that told me that, I said, man, we can all be some fighting MFers in here tonight because, yeah. you know, you can't give the pulse to your commanders or to the sect or the chairman if you aren't being vocal and being present and being vocal, being present where— the points of friction are like in Somalia or Afghanistan or wherever the troops are fighting and then reporting that information back. And then the other things they, you know, would question me, how does an enlisted person think that their place is to talk policy? I wasn't talking, po- I, that the doesn't point. sound like policy to yeah, me. As a matter of fact, if we had that policy within the military, I think it'd be great. Standard issue, we're going to give you an entrenching tool. Yeah. And you have to get uh, three to five, you know, CODA skills. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's military strategy. Yeah. Well, and this is how place. the character of conflict has changed. Mm. So the vast majority of veterans that are, uh, you know, Desert Storm kind of veterans, I mean, I'm one myself. Yeah. They would talk to me, yeah, that shovel's like used. World War II veteran as well, I mean. No, not that, <laughs> not, not that old yet, Korea. brother. I read about Desert but, Storm uh, in a history yeah. book, yeah. But uh, those folks would say, oh, yeah, that e-tool, that's used for taking a dump or whatever. Sure. Yeah. But the yeah. troops that have fought, this generation of troops that did the hard fighting after 9-11 up until just a few years ago when we really, other than our special operations forces, weren't doing hard fighting, mm. they, were, they, they associated the e-tool with a weapon to kill the enemy. And now the entrenching tool has become a symbol for living the warrior ethos, whether it's military, whether it's uh, law enforcement, where there's military families, whether it's kids of military. Now they associate that entrenching tool with something that uh, makes them feel 
like they they are Americana, I mean, you know. I mean, and so warrior. I started my uh, my E Tool Nation. I trademarked the E Tool Nation, and and for the rest of my life, it'll be associated with John Wayne Troxel. And, and That's well, it should be. And correct me if I'm wrong. You, you are literally signing E Tools and passing them out to people. How many at this point in time? Uh, just over sixteen hundred in three years. Sixteen hundred E Tools. And uh, and this all comes out of your pocket, right? Yes. Well, <laughs> um, the uh, the the shipping has to be uh, uh, paid for by the person who wants me to sign it. But but uh, now, you know, with my eTool Nation apparel line and everything, we're going to have people can go to my uh, my consulting page website, pmehard.com yes. consulting, and they can go onto our apparel line. And here in the very near future, they can order an eTool. I'll sign it and I'll mail it to them. They can get eTool Nation t-shirts. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to have other swag on there, you know. I, I thought when I started this that, you know, it might be moderately successful, but within 30 days, you know, we're running on empty on supply now. And so, um, it, again, I go back to this is something when you look at like the Medevac podcast mm. or Black Rifle Coffee Company or E-Tool Nation, all of these names are associated with the warrior class yes. of people, yeah. whether they're in the military, whether in law enforcement, first responders or their families of that, or whatever, or even the children. You know, I just did an event where I signed uh, 50 entrenching tools and gave them away. And To the children? Well, 44 of them <laughs> went to kids. Yes! <laughs> and when a six-year-old kid Start and a five-year-old kid, I sign an e-tool and hand it to them, they immediately hold it over their head like they just slayed an ISIS terrorist. Oh, uh, yeah. That that's tells me, so mean, now... It's a Rambo shot That's what shot we right need there. in our children today. We need to give them a little bit of that military mindset. Yeah, right? that little oomph to be proud of. We're getting beat up here yeah. in America. You know, yeah. we, need, we need that motivation back. We need to showcase... Yeah, uh, that this is a community, and you know, not only is it to ed educate others, you know, about these stories, you know, throughout the military, first responder community, but it's to engage with the civilian population as well, and yeah, and educate them to understand what we're facing every day. Yeah, and that mindset development too for children is really important. I mean, you want to Absolutely. raise them to be able to defend themselves, to be able to defend their families, take care of themselves. Right? We end up in a, a bad situation. You want somebody who's going to have a level head. And I mean, you can raise them to, that, to be that way, correct? Yeah. I mean, so I'll tell you with my grandchildren, you know, um, I've always kind of been a pro wrestling fan, you know, since I was a kid. So <laughs> yeah. routinely with my four grandchildren, you know, I'll, I'll do uh, some Greco Roman knuckle locks with them, nice. you know, put a little, you know, and some people will say that I'm abusing my grandchildren, but just put a little bit of physical pain on them. Yeah. The minute they say uncle to grandpa, then I let them go. He, or, you know, I get them with the ice clamps. If you ever watched the movie Paradise Alley with, uh, <laughs> with uh, Sylvester yep. Stallone, the yep. brother was the yep. wrestler, get them with the ice clamps, Vic. Yeah. So I'm always getting my grandkids with the ice So much that my 18-year-old granddaughter, when I say, Papa's going to give you the ice clamps, she's putting I, her dang protection on. This, this guy might be a bully, actually. Yeah. <laughs> well, then, you know, the last one is the motorcycle that I used to do to my kids, you know, and you just grab them by the ears and twist a little bit. But it's all designed <laughs> so that the first time they feel any kind of physical pain isn't when it's out on a street somewhere or any kind of adversity like that. In my middle son, Michael, he, he comes to visit a lot, and my little grandson, Claudio, and he comes over and says, Papa, Claudio's been practicing mercy. He's ready for you, you know? Yeah. So yeah. It, it's now become commonplace to be able to do things like that, you know? And not only does it get kids off the internet, I mean, my grand, my oldest grandson and granddaughter, I make them do mercy against each other yeah. all the time, you Perfect. know? And, uh, I mean, you can't coddle. You can't coddle. No, absolutely. Not at all. Yeah. And that's the thing, too, is that, I mean, we're even seeing this in the military, you know, I mean, the red cards and like everybody, <laughs> everybody bailing out when the purpose, the sole purpose is putting your body through that stress. Absolutely. And and the mental fortitude that you have to develop in order to close with and destroy the enemy, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, annihilate the Absolutely. En enemy. Absolutely. And you can't do that when you hurt yourself on a paper cut or, yeah. you know, or something you're worried like about that. the enemy's so, feelings. And, and, you know, that's what we get all the time, too, is like, like a lot of these injured people are coming in and talking about their stories. And they're still, you know, reverting to the training, you know, back to the basics. You ask those guys, what was the first thing you did after you get hit? All right, self-assessment, you know, and then assess the room and try to execute the mission yeah. to the best ability that I could, I could do it, yeah. you know? You know, my first combat tour was uh, the invasion of Panama in 1989. 
peacetime military. We did a lot of training to practice airfield seizures and expanding lodgements and, yeah. and getting after things. But I never thought, because we were pe peacetime military, it was going to happen. And then we saw how things were going in Panama, where a lieutenant had been killed. Another military family had been assaulted by these Panamanian defense forces mm. in Noriega's Dignity Battalions. And uh, all of a sudden, 19 December, 1989, I, I kissed my wife goodbye that morning. I said, hey, when we get home, half-day schedule, you know, during Christmas, I said, we'll go uh, shopping for the boys and, and get them some Christmas presents. Well, I never made it home. I got in. We got alerted, marshaled. Uh, we drew live ammunition, uh, got briefed that we were jumping at 500 foot, uh, AGL into, uh, Trujillo's international airport. And all of a sudden now, well, this shit's real now it's time to, yeah. and the, what you have to fall back on is what you just described, Dave. You have to fall back on your training. 70% of our tactical level force now does not have that hard combat experience like you gentlemen have, you know, like I have. I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but I'm saying that our training better mimic the chaos, uh, the brutality and unforgiveness of what combat is. And you can't coddle people out in the field and worry more about are they getting hot chow instead of how are we executing these uh, live fire exercises or these major exercises or whatever. And that's the stress you're doing behind it, right? Absolutely. I mean, so what, as a leader, you know, as someone with vast experience in military leadership, you know, give us, give us the down and dirty reasoning by, behind why you put people so much, through so much stress. Because uh, I wanted to be an asshole in training. So, you know, when, when you're hard on people as a military leader, that's born out of love, yeah. not hate. If, if I generally didn't care about my subordinates, I would let them do whatever they want to. And that's how I equate leaders that allow standards to go to shit in a combat zone mm. because the minute you allow uh, the, the folks in your organization to make the rules on what standards are in your organization, they're going to do the same thing in terms of pre-combat inspections, pre-combat checks, yep. and then execution of actions in combat. And so if we take care of the basics, you know, how they look, how they act, how they talk, how they perform, chances are when, when they come up against the you know, the, you know, El Kukui, the, big, the boogeyman, yeah. they are going to yeah, yeah. come out on top. I mean, there's a saying in the military, train harder than you fight. Yes. Right? I mean, you have to expose yourself to extreme circumstances so that when you get there, you know, honestly, it should be easier. You know, when, yeah. I, when I deployed, you know, it was, it was like a vacation, you know, from yeah. all the training that we were doing. And, you know, I mean, you got some downtime, you know, on the side. But, you know, and that's what, what pushes you there, right? Going to ranger school, doing these leadership courses, that's what gets you mentally prepared to face yeah. the enemy. And if you're worried about, you know, just like you said, if you're worried about everything else but that hot chow, you know, where's the, you know, where's the food right now? It's like, you, you're not going to be effective in, in doing your job at the end of the day. You know, and if I can give you an example, during the surge in Iraq, I had an organization attached to my striker brigade and I went out I, every day I went on a combat patrol with some platoon in that brigade. Okay. I was never in the same area at the same time or, you know, for days on end. I was constantly going around. So this organization wasn't a parent, a part of our organization. They were attached. And as we were out on patrol, we came under fire and we started pursuing the enemy. Hmm. And, you know, the, the, the palm groves were pretty rough, you know, and we had to get in there and, and get through stuff and everything. And all of a sudden, the platoon leader stops. And uh, makes everybody, you know, take a knee, drink water and everything. And, and uh, he tells the platoon sergeant, yeah, we're going we're gonna to cease this mission. So I came up to him. I said, you have the enemy on the run and you're pursuing him. Why are you ceasing this mission? He said, well, we want to get back before the chow hall closes. <laughs> and that was his quote. That was a quote from a first lieutenant. Wow. In charge of a platoon, an infantry platoon. Infantry I mean, platoon. and that's got to be something that's even more irritating. Yeah. Is an, at, you know, it, like you have, thir you had 38 years or whatever the time yeah. in at the time and, and having someone come in fresh out of college trying to tell you what to do. How do you feel with that? Well, I think there's, there's an art associated with officer and enlisted relationships. There is. Um, because the experience of the NCO at the platoon level far outweighs the rank 
and, uh, you know, the capabilities of the lieutenant. But the further they go up the ranks, the more the officer's experiences and, and uh, leadership catches up with the enlisted. Um, but the, the key thing, the further the officer goes up the ranks, the further they are pulled away from the troops. Yes. Enlisted ranks, we're, we're in the people business all the time. We Even can transcend. At that level is. Scary. Yeah. As the SEAC, I could transcend, and I routinely transcended the tactical, operational, strategic levels. I could talk to Congress one day, and the next day I could be in uh, Baladogli, Somalia, with uh, a, a SEAL platoon, you know, uh, on patrol. So, and, uh, and as long as you're a leader that, and, you know, and I call it the three, feet, the three Ps, you're present, meaning you're where the troops are living in squalor or enduring hardships and everything or facing combat. A leader that's persistent in, in being balanced between discipline and compassion and enforcing standards and ensuring combat readiness. And then you, as a leader, you're performing that you're not expecting your subordinates to do anything that you ain't going to do yourself. Yeah. You're going to be looked at as a pretty good leader, and you're probably going to have a cohesive organization, yes. you know, regardless of what the makeup of that organization is in terms of race, gender, or sexual orientation. Yeah. And that's how I think we get beyond it is in, uh, the challenges we're having today is engaged leadership at all levels mm. that transcends that stuff by being present, persistent, and performing. Yeah. And how do you apply that to the military today then? How do you, how do you explain that to current military leaders and yeah. get them to change their minds? Because we're, I mean, military has been around for a long time. Yep. We've evolved, but we're really set in our ways right now, right? And it just seems so extremist. So it, like, it we're, we're like either so far left or so far right. Yeah, just like Christian said, it's like, how do you balance that and, and present your case to leadership? So I think um, you have to look at the audience you have. And, and you have to know what drives those people. You have, culturally, you have to know who they are and where they come from and, and things like that. And you can't get caught up in stuff that has no significance. Yes. You know, um, whether someone is, ha, is, has a same-sex marriage or is a homosexual means nothing to me. Yeah. Okay? It makes no it's, difference. And now, now, people will look <laughs> at me as, yeah, people will look at me as like I have some, no. I'm not looking as no leaders against or troops. I want them, you're a soldier first or a sailor first or whatever. And I have a very yeah. good friend that's an E-9 in the Air Force, and he's a homosexual, but he is one of the most phenomenal leaders I've ever been associated with, and I consider him one of my very close friends. I could care less. Don't give a shit. I, yeah. n that has no bearing it on how, what I think of that person effect. as a man. Yeah. yeah, you in your mission. Yeah, right? at the end of the day, you should be yeah. able to execute it. Your job title. It doesn't need to be known, and it yeah. doesn't. You know, I mean, in, it's it's. Yeah. And it is what it is. It's right? almost immaterial. Yeah, it's as immaterial. Far as, it as far I've as been I'm married to, yeah. I've been married to a minority for almost thirty eight years. My wife is a, a second generation Mexican, and. Uh, she comes from a, a family of 19 kids. Mm. And so my, my kids are biracial. My grandkids have Mexican blood in them. The vast majority of my friends, our friends, mm. are minorities. And the things about racism and stuff never comes up because we treat each other with mutual respect, regardless of what race or gender or sexual orientation they are. And we treat each other with dignity uh, in everything we do, which is... Yeah. And, and that's how it should so be. So transcend military. all of yeah, that stuff. Yes. And I will tell you that one of my best friends is a, an African-American female, a uh, world record strong woman holder. And I went and trained with her on a Saturday. <laughs> she doing some of, of this. Oh, <laughs> she eat you up. She I'm wore sure. my ass out. But she has been a friend. Her and her, her family has been friends with my family, yeah. with Sandra and I, for t over 20 years. And they are probably the closest family that we've ever been associated with. And they're an African-American family. Her husband is Caucasian, so their children are biracial, you know. But the bottom line is none of that. We never talk about any of that when, in, in our engagements. It's supposed to be a melting pot, right? Yeah. It's supposed right. to be a community that all comes together. And it, and it has no merit. I, I mean, for me, when I got out of the military and, you know, you see what's going on in today's world, mm -hmm. it's almost, when you come from that background, baffling to you because it just, it didn't matter. Yeah. You know, while yeah. we were in. It, it did. never mattered. You know, it was like, who's who's at the left of you and who's at the right? And like, let's get everybody home and together. And then, you know, embrace the suck, right? When, yeah. you, when you embrace the suck together, you become, you know, a brotherhood. 
of individuals that it, it just doesn't matter. I mean, yeah. you know, you want the most effective leader. You want the most ex- effective troops on the battlefield with you. And, it, you know, I don't take applications for your, you know, religious preference or your background or anything like that. It, but how do you, more importantly, as a leader, how do we break that mentality? Like, what do yeah. you do, you know, within your conversations to say, hey, listen, guys, it doesn't matter. Well, so I give it, it's just due. Do we have challenges in the military? Yes. We got challenges with sexual assault, sexual harassment. We have challenges with suicide. Yeah. There are racists in our formation. Yeah. Um, and I would even say that there are some extremists in our formation across the Department of Defense. Sure. But I don't see those as systemic problems. Mm. I just don't see it. Um, you know, I've spoken, I, I do motivational and leadership speaking all around the world. And when I see a formation of sergeant majors from the division guy to the brigade guys down to the battalion guys, and the vast majority of them are minorities, to me, that's not a systemic racism problem. That means that they got to where they're at because they are, they are great leaders, you know? Yeah. So my point in all of this is stay focused on what is the important stuff, as you just described, yeah. Dave, the war fighting embracing the suck, and getting after that. And I, I will tell you, a leader that leads by example mm-hmm. and does those three Ps that I talked about, chances are they won't ever have to address mm. the racism, the you know gender stuff, or the uh, alternative lifestyle stuff. Sure. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, uh, and I think that's what we got to focus on. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, uh, I, just my opinion, you know. I, I, and I feel like, too, there, there's just such a leadership disconnect as well, you know, with everything you said. But, you know, people are always focused about what other people think or how to advance their careers to the point that they're sacrificing their own guys on the field. Like, you know, we, and that's, that, that's our bread and butter, too, is what we talk about on the show is we're seeing this, like, you know, delineation between a lack of communication, a lack of leadership. And these are all ultimately leading into people getting hit, yeah. and getting injured because ultimately they want to put more candy on their, you know, on their, their breast. And it, yeah. it just, it makes no sense. So, so I, I mean, is there a position too that, that you see people doing that in leadership is where they're not, you know, they're looking out for themselves and not looking out for the troops? Yeah. Well, and I will tell you, that's how distrust is built between the leader and the led as we call it in our leadership manuals. And when there's distrust, then uh, hypersensitivity will kick in. And pretty soon you will have people in the formations, whether it's the leader or those they lead, that all of a sudden can, you know, find an insult in a bouquet of roses or... You know, they see, I mean, they see toxic people under bed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean. Yeah. <laughs> Exhibit A. Well, I'm going to tell ISIS that we're going to kill them with an entrenching tool. And people think that, you know, I have something against Muslims when I absolutely do not. Yeah, you know, I, mean, it, I, I wasn't talking about Muslims. I was talking about radical, insidious terrorists mm. that routinely chop the heads off and of everybody, Muslims. Everybody you know? should hate a terrorist, right? I mean, yeah. <laughs> everybody should hate a terrorist. Absolutely. No who you are. Yeah. If they're a terrorist, you hate them. Yeah. Right? Yeah. If there's someone else's freedom fighter. I get that. You yeah. Know? But like, at, at, you know, we shouldn't have other people come at you uh, for going after the other enemy, Americans. Right? As a matter of yeah. fact, we should be like, yeah, we want this guy <laughs> yeah. right, right where he's at. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I'm with you. So I think, again, Engage leadership. And I hear these leaders talk all the time, you know, about I'm a leader of change. Kayla, did you know with Black Rifle Coffee's Coffee Club subscription, you can get fresh coffee shipped to you every month? What? You don't even have to go to the store. Whoa. You don't even have to leave your bed. What? Wow. How did you get in here? You might want to go ahead and join the Black Rifle Coffee Club subscription before one of these guys shows up at your place. Changing what, you know? And for what uh, reason? Yeah, okay, what are you trying to change? What is the problem you're trying to solve? Great point that you bring in. Okay. Change of command is a great example of yeah. that. You come in and you just, I'm, I'm the new leader, let's just stir shit up until... 
Well, I see, I see a senior enlisted leader taking selfies with their troops on, and they put it on social media and somebody comes on and says, thank you for your leadership and everything. And the guy says, well, I'm just trying to be a leader of change. Changing what? Have, <laughs> have we been so jacked up in 38 years of the military? Never once did I think, man, this is a shitty institution that I'm associated with. Yes. I thought this mirrors what our nation should be, you know, or what our nation is. And this is the best example that we should give society on how all of us Americans should be. And when I see leaders that say, I'm a leader of change, well, what's the problem you're trying to change? Yes. And what's the end state of that change? Okay. If you're saying that just so people would, so you'll be popular with your troops or, or somebody on the social media, then you're part of the problem. Yeah. You ain't part of the solution. Change, change you know? for the sake of change in the military is yeah. the current issue, yeah. I think. Yeah. Uh, do we have yeah. to change? Yeah. Yes, because the character of conflict is going to continue mm -hmm. to evolve. Yeah. Now things like cyberspace and nuclear are domains that we have to gain competitive advantages in, you know, and yeah. we do have it. But we can't just be focused on maritime ground and air, and we can't yeah. say this is the way we've always done it before. Change is part of what we do. But if you're a leader that says you're trying to change because you're pampering subordinates or you're taking selfies with them and everything— you're part of the problem, not part of the solution, in my opinion. Yeah. So you mentioned to me earlier before the show that you you dealt with, you know, your your worst day of your life, your yeah. injury yeah. and stuff like that. And, you know, before we hear that story, because I'm very interested in hearing that, is do you think that what led up to that moment was a lack of communication, lack of leadership, or was it just, you know, situations totally out of your control? Like, uh, you know, I think... Uh, Arrogance and complacency mm -hmm. is what led up to it. So on the 15th of June of 2007, uh, I was on a routine patrol with my commander and our uh, PSD, and we came under fire from the town of Husanea, which is just north of Sadr City. And we repelled the threat. And then on the way back from the visit we were doing to a combat outpost, we got hit again, and we repelled that threat. And uh, then we got... Sigint uh, reflections that said, hey, we killed 15 to 20 uh, Shia militia members. And so the boys were all fired up, you know, hey, yeah, we kicked the shit out of them. And so I got them all together and I said, keep this in perspective. We got the enemy today. Yes. But I guarantee you they're going to come back. Yeah. yeah. So keep this in perspective. Don't run around now and all of a sudden think that, you know, we are God's gift to combat operations here. Yeah. And so... It was about five weeks later on the 19th of July, 2007, the worst day of my life. And we got hit by a, an Iranian explosive form penetrator. And if you know anything about Iranian explosive form penetrators, yeah. uh, they were developed by the uh, Iranian Guards uh, Corps Quds Force, commanded by a guy named Qasem Soleimani, and routinely issued to Shia militias to use on our troops. Yes. So when President Trump ordered the attack that killed Soleimani, I have zero regret and zero remorse that that insidious human being that is no longer on the planet. Such a fuss. <laughs> that raised oh, it did. such a fuss. But back to you, the, that story. So that day, we were doing terrain denial fires. We were moving out uh, to visit uh, another combat outpost, and we were doing terrain denial fires, and, uh, and we got hit by this EFP, and it killed... Uh, uh, one of our guys, Corporal Brandon Craig, who to this day, 14 years later, I still wear his name on my wrist, is severely wounded my fire support officer, Danny Dudek. Yeah. But in terms of what this podcast is all about, being the Medevac podcast, um, that day I learned that, you know, when I talk about a leader being a leader that performs, yeah. um, you can never ask a subordinate to do something that you won't do yourself. And you have to hold yourself to a higher standard but if you expect yourself to do something, you better get your subordinates to that level so on the worst day of their life, they can perform. So it's a normal July day in Iraq, 130 degrees out. Uh, I'm assisting. A, a, yeah, a, yeah. a balmy one. I, I remember the boys I had are, a sandwich uh, one day on the, with the cheese and it just melted immediately. I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you could, you could scramble eggs on your Humvee yeah, and everything, you know. Right but uh, um, the boys were repelling the threat and neutralizing the threat. The QRF was coming out. I was assisting yeah. the medic in the middle of the street under fire with treating Danny Dudek. And uh, we called in the medevac, and the medevac showed up, and the aircraft was about 300 meters away. So the medic, another one of my NCOs, and, and the flight medic, 
uh, who came over there. Now the flight me- medic was kind of a portly lad, you know, and I could tell <laughs> I can tell he wasn't lad. doing any PME hard lately. Yeah, but we yeah, well. proceeded to pick up Dudek and we started moving him to the medevac to, you know, get him out of there. And all of a sudden I could see that these three NCOs were starting to struggle. Mm. Like and they I struggled, did not the way, train right? well. The, they, they were becoming they like over, fatigued? overcome fatigued. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, their gas tanks weren't well, what's ready. What's your favorite? Example? First of all, I got to ask you what the all gas, what's the saying that you always say to well, me? Well, you, you can't be a muscle car in the military, you know, big engine, you know, so these big That's bodybuilder right guys, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, you, I call them muscle cars because, you know, they have a big engine, but generally a little gas tank. Yeah. All the muscles are pretty. But they won't get your ass to the top of the Hindu Kush mountains in Runs Afghanistan, quick, you know, right in the, or get you out in that dusty ass desert oh, yeah. in freaking southern Somalia, too. you know, to get after Al Shabaab and everything. But uh, they basically were becoming heat casualties, and I and I realized then that it was it was my fault that I was taking, uh, I was giving a little bit of latitude when it come to PT and hydration and things like that. And that's when I doubled down on our NCOs and said, you guys got to get after this yes. stuff. Yes. This is an example of where now we could have been very vulnerable had we not had the QRF show up and neutralized the threat yes. and everything. But the bottom line is, in anything we do, uh, I don't care how good we are technically and tactically, if we aren't uh, having a strong base that is based off our physical fitness, our mental and emotional wellness, mm. It doesn't matter how technically and tactically good we are. That I mean, that is that's right on the head too. Is is you gotta you gotta induce stress. You gotta yeah. induce induce the pain within PT, so that when you get to those those moments where it's it's where like, it counts, yeah, where it counts. I mean, seconds count, right? Yeah, and and everybody who sits there is gonna think of you know <laughs> I should have. Should have brushed up on cardio. When yeah. I around. You know, I, I mean, and, and we well, and you, if you ask Colonel Danny Dudek today, if he what he remembers about that day, he remembers that we almost dropped his ass, mm-hmm. you know, in a ditch trying to get to the medevac, you know, and he had a major back injury, you know, that he's still dealing with with this day. So you were you were carrying this guy out, and we were all four were of us out. were yeah, and you know, we almost dropped him because these uh, NCOs were becoming heat casualties, you know. And uh, were you guys able to get him to the helicopter? We got him to the helicopter. I got him on board because, you know, if you know anything about John Wayne Troxel, I was (laughs) I was putting a healthy dose of verbal scunion on their ass that included a lot of (laughs) F-bombs. And, you know, that I am going to freaking smoke the dog shit out of you when you get back. You will never have to worry. (laughs) And it's all born out of love, brother. It's all out of love. I love you so much. This hurts me. Those two NCOs that were part of me are two men that I love very dearly. And they have a special place in my heart. But again, as a leader, you can't you can't be afraid to chew ass when it needs to chew ass. And yeah. right then, we were extremely vulnerable. And uh, not only could uh, we have come under further attack, but we could have exacerbated the injury that mm-hmm. Danny Dudek had from that, you know, that IED. Yeah. So, um, yeah. but we got him on the helicopter. I kissed him on the forehead and yeah. and said, "I love you, brother." And uh, you know, be well. You know, mm-hmm. and. So uh, the next time I saw him, he said, all I remember was uh, almost getting dropped. Yeah. And then you kissing me on the helicopter. <laughs> and I, An actual kiss. Yes. Well, I kissed him on the forehead like yeah. I would do one of my sons. Right on okay? the mouth. I wanted to make sure that there was no question <laughs> what that was about. I brushed okay. his ear behind, <laughs> you know, behind his brushed ear. Brushed his hair. Yeah. Took him on a nice yeah. date. Went deep into his eyes. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, if you're not getting laid after that. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a, that's a prime example about... Uh, proper preparation and what happens when you have a lack of preparation Yeah, when you're not meeting at least the bare minimum standard of how you need to operate overseas in training, you're setting yourself up for failure. But I love, I love what you said about taking ownership. Yeah. It was my fault. It was my fault. And I, I, you know, I was kicking my own ass after that. I'm telling you, I was like, man, I should have, because, you know, every day I was out doing PT and if I knew we were walking a lot, yeah. I would go and do a strength workout. If we were riding a lot, then I'd go on a run or something, sure. you know. And, and, you and see it got all to these the... people doing bench press, yeah, you know, at the gyms out there. And you're like, dude, that's not practical application. It's not functional. It's not, it's not functional, not. Yeah. right? And yeah. I'm sure we're going to get into that here. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <In a minute. laughs> yeah. The, the functional stuff, but yeah, and that that's the thing is is the you know you you say that it might have been your fault, but at the end of the day. 
you know, the other side of this story is, dear God, what if they didn't have you yelling in their ear? To, because at least for me, I mean, that's the motivation we see, right? Yeah. When someone's in my ear saying, you suck, like, I'm like, I'm like, fuck you. I'm going to prove that wrong. You know? <laughs> yeah. Let's push harder and get, get going. So like, honestly, thank God they had you out there. But, and, and you were able to see that issue. If you weren't there, you didn't see that issue. You could have prevented, you know, countless yeah. injuries by learning that lesson the hard way. Yeah. My first tour in Iraq during uh, Iraqi freedom was 03 and 04. And there was another IED incident. And uh, I had some folks traveling with me in my vehicle as extra security. Hmm. And uh, the minute this IED hit, I pulled up rear security and I told two of the NCOs in the Humvee, I said, get your asses down at this off ramp from uh, route Tampa and pull security down there. And then as they went down there and pulled security, you know, what goes down must come up, right? So they, they went downhill to pull security. And then all of a sudden we had to get out of there in a hurry uh, because of uh, rockets and mortars coming in. And I said, let's go, let's go. And those two guys coming up that hill, you know, struggling under the weight of their kit and everything. And I just started yelling at them, this is why the fuck we do PT, right fucking yeah. here, okay? <laughs> it's so that idiot. you can negotiate this fucking hill and get out of here yeah. safely, all right? And it, we get that from leadership all the time is, you know, uh, your, your drill sergeant or whoever, the ranger instructor is, you know, 47 percent body fat and they're like you suck and you're like wait a minute lead by example dude like i could you do this probably yeah. not With you know and so, so that's fat. that's what you're saying yeah you 48 percent that body goes fat. back to that leader perform the leader has to be the example you know i you know we could be here all day if we had a keg of beer you know but <laughs> we need a keg of beer <laughs> yeah. my first tour in iraq Dave, you know can we get a keg please i had a, a day i heard this from a command sergeant major yeah i mean yeah Make sure it's light beer, though. But uh, um, I heard a story from a command sergeant major in— Watch my girl. He wasn't going out of the wire at all. He was, he was worried about, you know, uh, you know, haircuts and cigarette butts on the fob and, and making grass, sure— how their grass the laundry. Yeah, the and I, I said, <laughs> I said, why aren't you going out of the wire? Grass policy. He goes, I got 29 years in the military. I said, what the fuck does that mean? He said, well, when this is over with, I'm retiring. It's not worth me going out of the wire. I said, oh, so your life means more than a 19-year-old private that has no choice, but they have to go out of the wire every day and get after the enemy. Then why are I you said, that is the worst kind of leadership bullshit I ever heard. How did he react to that? He just kind of looked at me like I was a bully, you know? And my point I mean, in all of this— Were you holding the e-tool, though, while you were talking? Yeah, well, I wish I was. This, was, like, over him. Is a this was 18 example. years before that. <laughs> but in the absence of leadership— on the, in combat or on the battlefield, the Joes will have the toughest job on the planet because they'll be du dual-hatted. Yes. In the absence of engaged leadership that is keeping them informed and delivering the why, they will have the toughest job in the world because they'll be dual-hatted. They will be a saw gunner or a grenadier or a, a rifleman and secretary of defense at the same time. Mm. If I was in charge of this motherfucker, we'd be doing this, you know, or I can't yeah. believe we're doing this <laughs> bullshit. So leaders have to be engaged at all. And if the damn battalion command sergeant major says, it's too dangerous out there, Sarge, and I'm retiring next year. Yeah, I should say that. You can only imagine how that, that, you know, when I was in, you know, yeah. I can only imagine the flack I would have got, you know, well, this you know, lowly NCO, you know. <laughs> but, but for every leader like that, you know, then we have an organization that is built off that kind of leadership. And I guarantee you, and this organization was one of them, that struggled in retaining the initiative against the enemy and neutralizing the enemy and building security for the Iraqi population out there. It just, uh, when I hear shit like that, it just, you know, I'm like, that's not what being a leader, I don't care yeah. how high you get in rank. Yeah. You know, as a SEAC, my job was to get the pulse of the force for the SECDEF and chairman. And you don't do that in the Pentagon. Nope. You do that in places like Somalia or or Iraq, or Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, Libya, places like that, yeah. the Korean DMZ, mm -hmm. places like that, you ain't going to get the pulse of the force sitting in your office. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, I, I think that you recognize a really good aspect of things, too, is, is, is one, it's lead, lead from the front. Yes. And two, you realized how important, you know, fitness is within the military. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, everybody, every talk, everybody talks about, tre you know, troops are, you know, food is so important, right? And it is. It, it is a huge aspect. Nutrition is a big thing. And I know, I know you, 
are focused on that Absolutely. very hard. But I mean, how did that translate into how you executed when you got back? I mean, did you did you smoke these guys more? Did you make it more functional? What was what, well, I, I what was think, the change that you yeah. made? The change I made is I I had more eyes on mm. to what they were doing. I had basically uh, had come com- complacent in my checks of what they were doing. You assumed that they were I doing assumed the that right they were thing. doing the right thing. Yeah. And most of them were doing the right thing. You know, they were doing PT, they were doing it on their own and everything. But that incident on 19 July told me that I better get back, not micromanage, but have more eyes on on what my, the expectations are. And we got better at that, you know. But uh, you know, we were fighting uphill when you talk nutrition because, you know, Kellogg Brown and Root those chow halls over there. I mean, if a troop wanted to go in there and get burgers, fries, and apple pies, he could get whatever he wants. The cake and pie line that the little yeah. Sri Lankan dude ran, <laughs> he could go over there and say, I want one whole cake and one whole pie. <laughs> and go that dude right wasn't going to stop room. him from getting all that shit. Yeah. Yeah, but if you wanted fresh lettuce or fruit, fresh vegetables, they had a premium on it. You can only have one freaking potato or, or, or a few green beans, you know? We had this shit upside down, you know? Yeah, and it's got to be like that. I mean, it, it should be managed a little bit better on the nutritional aspect yeah. of things because, you know, I, I, I mean, and, and waivers for everything nowadays. Yeah. It's like, ah, it's like, <laughs> oh, you hit 48% <laughs> and you're back to it, you know? Yeah. So, like, what's the change with that is like, and then those conversations are difficult because, People want to make superficial changes, but they don't want to get down and dirty, especially when you're, you know, looking at doing a change of command into, yeah. oh, that's the next guy's problem. Yeah. He'll deal with the nutritional aspect of things. So, you know, we can't, we can't have leaders that are just trying to get people to the minimal standard. We have to have a positive deviance that strives toward excellence in everything we do. Mm, yeah. And it starts every morning. Think of this, the best hour and a half, two hours that any organization in the military can have to get after shared hardships and build cohesiveness and leaders leading through their example is our physical fitness sessions. Yes. Yes. And I got at some organizations that are on shift and everything, you know, have to go a different route. But in the end, you know, that is the best time to get after it. And too many times, I will tell you, as the SEAC, you know, I would go and do PT with units. And instead of this being a focused effort to get after the things we needed, to build that foundation for combat readiness, it was basically precision organized grab ass. And, <laughs> and I'm like, if you're going to waste a troop's time like that, why even get their lazy asses out of bed at 6.30 in the morning you, you to do freaking doing, PT if you're going to waste their time? You, you must know? have been doing PT with the Air Force. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, <laughs> uh, group PT was not mandatory. No comment, you know. <laughs> no comment. I, although the we Air Force does have the ugliest PT uniforms on the planet, all right? So. Somebody needs to do something about those. Uh, and, and, you know, you bring up such a good point, too, is, is um, uh, you know, you, we're focused on, you know, a power play or control or yeah. anything like that, too, is, is uh, and, and you could further expound on this, but, you know, everybody's worried about smoking somebody or exerting their power, exerting their force, especially with the lower enlisted, you know, tap spec fours when they come into battalion, they're the gods, right? Yeah, yeah. And then as you progress in your leadership role, you know, it, it's, let's talk about practical application. Let's talk about how to functionally put this training into effect where they could learn from their mistakes through proper training. But I mean, we all know that you could train someone's ass off <laughs> and still have them become stronger and better right. at what they do. Right. So, so that's where PME hard comes yeah. in, right? Yes. And, and you're, you're, doing, you're continuing to do that now. So you learned that lesson throughout the military, and then you got out and you were like, I'm going to train everybody else too. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just, uh, so there's two types of retirees, especially when it comes to senior enlisted. There's the enablers and there's the agitators. Hmm. You know, for 20 years as a sergeant major at all levels, especially when I was an installation sergeant major, you know, at, at First Corps, Joint Base lewis McCord, or at Fort Knox at the Armor Center, I would get calls from retired sergeant majors that were pissing and moaning because Popeyes charged more for a meal on post than they did off post. And, and then they would say, you know, you're screwing troops and stuff like this. Or they would... Uh, continue to say, well, in my day, we wouldn't put up with this shit. Those are the agitators that just needs to have a healthy cup of shut the fuck up, okay, <laughs> and be what you are. 
as a retiree and when you're an enabler, you're there to help the current operating yes. force. And that's what I try to pride myself on being, which is why I continually get asked to come and do leadership and motivational speaking, do PT with the troops and everything. Because not only do I talk about, I don't have to have a filter now because I'm not on active duty. <laughs> yeah. But I also don't have a, for that. Yeah. And I, I don't have I authority either. You can't say fuck on this show. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. yeah, but uh, you know, if if all of a sudden I start saying that I'm concerned about things because we're not talking about fighting and winning, uh, we're talking more about some of these uh, internal issues mm. that are consuming attention more so than the combat readiness training. Uh, if if I say something like that um, and they don't like it, they can throw my ass out because I have no authority. I'm yeah. a retiree, you know. Yeah. Um, but the bottom line, I keep getting invited back. And I asked a, a senior enlisted leader of one of the Army divisions one time, I said, why do you think I keep getting invited back? They say, he said, well, SEAC, you're delivering a message that needs to be heard, and it's not happening from people within uniform. Mm. And I thought that was a powerful point that he made. And so it's the institution gave me everything. 38 years in the military, I met my wife in there, and we've been married almost 38 years. I, I came in, barely graduated out of high school, and I have a master's degree in strategic leadership, and, uh, and I was able to serve at the highest level. So I want to give back. Yeah. Yeah. But that doesn't mean I'm going to be out there and tell everybody everything is beer and Skittles, you know, and, yeah. and yeah. you guys are doing great work and everything. I mean, if I see something that I don't agree with, I'm going to speak out. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think that, you know, throughout your career and the time that we've known each other, yeah. it's like I've seen that, that uh, you know, that in your attitude and your personality is like, you want to be in there, you want to be in the mix. And uh, I, I mean, we met in Scotland on a, and we'll get into that in a minute. Yeah, is, uh, I need so to tell you, that story. You yes. Were, okay. yes, you were in, as an active duty SEAC at the time when we met in Scotland. Yeah. But uh, we're, you know, you were out there with the allied forces. So tell us a little bit about the YUM, first of all. Yeah, so, uh, you know, the key thing, the, one of the key important things with uh, the United States military is our partnerships and alliances. So anything we do with other nations, like from NATO or, you know, uh, folks like that, um, we ought to embrace that. And so the Cataran Yomp uh, was one of those things, you know, that a, a 54 mile hike through the Scottish Highlands where William Wallace fought with uh, People from 50 different nations out there. Thousand coalition wounded. Thousand coalition wounded. Specifically. And specifically yeah. the audience being wounded, ill, and injured. I said, this is a great place for me to build on these uh, partners and, 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 and alliances. What are they doing? Why are they there? To yeah. get together and embrace the suck. Yeah. Yes. Right. Because that event sucked. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. 24 hours to complete 54 miles. Straight uphill the entire yeah. time. Yeah. You know, that sounds well, cool. and then if I could tell the story about how we met, which has fueled me even more to continue to get after stuff. So I met Dave uh, on the Yomp there and we yeah. talked and, you know, he's former uh, second Ranger Battalion guy. And, and I, I spent a lot of time at JBLM as a striker brigade and a first Corps guy. And we kind of hit it off. And then uh, we ended up from like mile seven to mile 14. We were walking together and we were just talking and everything. And like at mile 14, I said, hey, Dave, I got to stop and change my socks. And he said, yeah, me too. And, <laughs> and, no, and no, so no, I, I still didn't know. I still did that. not know that he was a wounded warrior. Oh, So shit. we sat down on this little tree log and I took my boots off and my socks. And all of a sudden he pulls one of his boots off and he's got a prosthetic. Yeah. And I said, this guy has been dusting my ass for the last seven <laughs> miles. And he's only got one leg. Was that about muscles and muscle car? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, he was a little bit of a muscle car there. I was there, a little you know? bigger back then. Yeah, yeah. Too. But I thought, man, this is what living the warrior ethos hmm. is all about. You serve your country. You get severely wounded in combat. And you do not let that deter you. You come back physically mentally and emotionally to overcome this disability that he has now. Yeah. And I, it almost brought tears to my eyes sitting there right there at the mile 14. It wasn't tears that you were walking too fast, dude. It was like, dang, I love yeah, you, Yeah, we were smoking. <laughs> you know. But uh, no, I, I, I just, was yelling at him the whole time. I'm hurry up, you fat Hurry up, kid. <laughs> fuck like, cry, like, I'm we, Another two miles and we get a shot of Scottish whiskey, know. you know? And that's me with love towards you. Yes. That's all. It absolutely. <laughs> it's love, you know? I mean, yeah. I, you're, you're entirely right, though, John. I mean, I've, I've known David for over 15 years now. Yeah. 
I'm going to talk about you like you're not here right yeah, now. Yeah, it was just talk, ignore me. Smoke him here. if you got him. Yeah. Christian's yeah, you, got you the floor. Where's that beer you take at, a break. Dave? <laughs> <laughs> Where's that keg? <laughs> um, no, I, you're entirely right, though. I mean, I, I got to watch firsthand when, after Dave got injured and watched to see what he did with that. Did he use it and bask in it and, yeah. and cry and bitch about it? Or did he use it to help grow? And he did. He absolutely did. I mean, you, you've you've done so well for yourself since then. And it's absolutely inspiring to me. Well, I appreciate, appreciate the love. Well, it's, 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 it's we did a killer 90-minute yeah. PT session with a bunch of troops this, this morning, morning yeah. over at Ratama Park. I and a couple, of them, uh, yeah. Were, yeah, we a couple of them were kind of complaining a little bit. And I said, you see who I'm PTing with? You see what that guy's <laughs> yeah. got? He's yeah. got a prosthetic. Shut I said, this would, <laughs> this would be a perfect opportunity for you to have a healthy cup of shut the yeah. fuck up. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. The fuck and up. just do what we're doing. Yeah. Yeah. But, but that's the whole point is you need to face adversity in your life to understand where you're going to go next. There's, yeah. two, there's a fork in the road that you, you get to at a certain point. You could go left. You could go right. One of which is, you know, advancing, using that to advance yourself, to better yourself and yeah. lead by example. And that's what I want to do. I want to go to those events and just smoke the shit out of people mm-hmm. yeah. so they could say, I have no excuse. Yeah. And that's the point is, is leading from the front and leading. It's not, not that we want to beat everybody and no. we want to win. That ship sailed 30 yeah. years and, ago on me, brother. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, we want, you know, to not let the adversity, the obstacles in our lives uh, bring us to a grinding halt. Right. And, and you, you know, it's your choice on how you do that at the end of the day. You know, you sat yeah. there and you recognized uh, that there, there is a lack of communication, a lack of leadership within this. So you're going to step in and, and better that. Absolutely. You know, Christian does the same thing within, you know, within rescue. You know, it's like, yeah. uh, you know, this guy will tell you, it's like, you know, when, when they get the call, you know, it's five to seven minutes to get on the bird. And he's sitting there thinking, how do we get it to, you know, how do we get it to six minutes? How do we get it to five minutes yeah. at this time? And you got to be forward thinking in order to be successful. Absolutely. I agree. Yeah. Using those negative experiences is really important. There's something I like to call the totality of life experience. I'm not sure if I came up with it or I yeah. heard it somewhere. But you made it up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> having, Everything you came up with. <laughs> yeah, it's mine. It's my yeah. trademark. Um, but having, having negative experiences is just as, as important as having positive experiences. So you're able to better identify where those fall in the line, right? If, if life is between one and 10, one's horrible and 10's great or the best possible, most people are like living four to six. But if you have an event that happens to you, that's a two or a one getting injured in combat, I think it opens up that door to identify what are the eights and the nines in your life? Where are those really good experiences? Yeah. And it, it, it's, it's impossible to identify those without seeing the other end of the spectrum. You know, I think- and I think as a leader, if you feel... If the, if the satisfaction you get is seeing your subordinates excel and do things and reach their untapped potential, then you're probably a pretty good leader. And if you're a leader that when, when one of your subordinates fails something and you have as much grief over it as they do, you know, when I was a uh, platoon sergeant in the 82nd, back in the 80s, one of my best NCOs, we sent him to jump master school three times and he failed every time. Mm. And I felt so bad for him because I wanted him to excel. Yeah. Mm. Um, so if you're, if, if you have more uh, feelings for that than you do for yourself, you're probably a pretty good leader, you know, because yeah. you're, you're selfless in your approach and we need more of that, uh, in this world. And especially now we need it. Yeah. I, I mean, I so agree more. you mentioned too, that you do a lot of motivational speaking yeah. you know, as just a caveat to what you're saying. Like, what is one of your favorite things to tell people? Well, obviously, surrender or die. You know, the, you know, beating people to death is e tool is one. <laughs> but you know, um, surrender or die. That's yeah. it. Motivation accomplished. <laughs> but I think it's it's also the nonverbal language you use, where you look people in the eye and you tell them, you know, you got to be this leader of. of uh, you know, consequence and you got to be present, you got to be persistent and you got to be performing, you know, and all of this and, uh, and your, your hand and arm signals, your boisterousness, your eye contact, all of that stuff is what captures an audience. And then the message you give after that. So I just try to make, you know, whatever I do and wherever I speak at, that it's not going to be a waste of people's time. You may hate me when you walk out, but you won't be (laughs) bored. 
You know, I <laughs> I had to You're tell a quick to story about I was the SEAC and I was visiting visiting San Diego Naval Station and I had a theater for, full of sailors I was talking to. And uh, I'm up there talking, doing my thing. And I look down in the second row and there's a dude down there that is just, I'm not talking <laughs> he's doing this. This dude is like this. Totally asleep. <laughs> so I just said, he's totally asleep. Uh, so I said, hey, wake that guy up. Knife hand. Everybody's like, you know, they, 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 <laughs> I said, the guy next to you. And all of a sudden the guy wakes up, he looks around. I said, yeah, you get the fuck out. <laughs> he's like, I said, get out. I said, I flew all the way from Washington, D.C. here to deliver a message to you, and I'm not going to let you, so I'm not going to waste your time, and you're not going to waste my time, so get the hell out. Yeah. So then after the kid got up and walked out, everybody else was like, all of a sudden, yeah. oh, oh, shit, yeah. you yeah. know, yeah. 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 And, yeah. but afterwards, yeah. the master chief comes up to me that this kid reported to and was saying, oh, well, he's done this. He, 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 there was no sense of, man, I'm embarrassed that that kid fell asleep and you had to throw him out. He comes up and defends a kid. No responsibility. So this, no, res no accountability at all yeah. for this kid. Yeah. I don't like doing shit like that, but I refuse to be that leader that allows to, you know, for apathetic actions like that to exist when I'm doing something, mm. you know? And nor should it be. I mean, you and, if, you... and if a leader, that's one of their subordinates, they ought to take freaking responsibility for that and say, you know what, I apologize, I'll get him straight. Now, I don't know where that kid is today, but I'm hoping that he is a better person and a better service member because the SEAC threw his ass out of a theater, <laughs> all right? Well, you know, I do have a story about old John Wayne Truck here, I will <laughs> oh, say. Oh, boy. You know, this <laughs> guy is intense, <laughs> and he's all about the motivation, but I have seen this guy in Scotland. I heard he likes to sing. He likes to sing. All American rejects. Ooh. Yeah, not, my <laughs> not my favorite. Not my favorite. Gives you hell, I believe it was. Yeah. Yeah, I remember hell. sitting there. This guy's screaming at me after doing this. I'm more of a Blink-182 and the okay. Killers kind of okay. karaoke yeah. guy, you know. I even do Rancid now, you know, oh, Ruby I, Soho. Now, so. are you going to be it? releasing the music videos anytime soon? Because no. I want to see that. So what, what I'm not I as need... talented as guys like JT Taylor or <laughs> and, and, you know, and Matt Best and stuff. No, uh, no. That stuff will... Uh, remain in remain. my television room in uh, <laughs> Lakewood, Washington. So. <laughs> Behind but, closed uh, doors. But you know, one of the things I always tell people all the time, you, you can be an intense leader and, and you can focus getting after combat readiness, but you can have fun and enjoy life too. You, you know, have to. you have to train hard. Yeah. You have to fight hard, but it's okay to play hard too. Yep. And I, at every level, as a Sergeant Major, I used to tell people that on Friday nights, when, you know, we got a weekend off, I'm going to be at the club having a beer. I'm yeah. going to support our club system. And I invite all leaders to be there with me. Some people would say that I am glamorizing alcohol. Some of the oh. best problems of course are they do. fixed. Yeah. Of are course. fixed over a beer. Over you a know, beer. some yeah. of the hardest problems are fixed over a beer. Um, and then I would say, you know, when General Dunford interviewed me to be the SEAC, I told him, he says, is anything I need to know about you? I said, well, sir, I just want to let you know that my wife and I love to go dancing. We love to karaoke and we love adult beverages. And I said, if, if you don't have a, I said, but we do it responsibly. If you don't have a problem with that, then uh, we're your guy. And he said, hey, look, the next time you do that shit, invite me and Ellen over and we'll do it with you. You know, and that so, guy loves to drink. <laughs> yeah. So the point in all of this is as a leader, you can't be thinking that, man, I've got to hide anything that could be construed as, bad from my subordinates you know no. it means you're human yeah. because i say i like to drink beer doesn't mean i'm a bad leader now if i drink beer and get stupid and tear shit up and get a dui and everything then i'm probably a bad leader yeah. but if, if i because i love to drink beer and maybe some shots of soju and moonshine <laughs> and yes. and fireball doesn't mean i'm a bad leader it means i like to decompress and have fun and if i'm doing it with my wife in the confines of our home or at a bar where we're having fun um, it's even better because I'm doing quality family time. Definitely. I, I mean, that that just, that goes to show you too, is like the level of stress that you're facing. I mean, yeah. you got to have a, some downtime, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's incredible. So you, I mean, you're doing some, some incredible stuff. Where could we find you? Yeah, so uh, I have my company page, uh, www.pmehard.com. Uh, it is my consulting company. I provide uh, leadership and human performance solutions for organizational excellence. And uh, I also, on Facebook, uh, I have an eTool Nation page Ooh. that is growing by the minute. 
Where in, we could find a E tool, right? Signed by you. Soon, We're going to get soon. one on the wall right behind us? You can. Oh, Absolutely. It's, oh, yeah. Pro, it's a done deal. Yeah. Done deal. Oh, yeah. You're going to get an E tool wall. signed. Yeah. I won't right? pay for shipping, though. Yeah. No, you won't. <laughs> no, you won't. <laughs> It's too much. I did buy you yeah. lunch today, though, so you owe me. All right, <laughs> and yes. you gave me that forehead kiss as well. But... Yeah, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, and I'm I am on all forms of social media, and uh, you know, Etool Nation is uh, is uh, growing significantly in our apparel line. We are going to continue to make it more robust, and uh, we're going to continue to do things that will allow people to bask in what they are or what they believe in, and that's this warrior class of Americans mm. that believe in this country and believe in protecting it. So that's how we'll get after it. Representing uh, and developing the warrior class within the United States. And Boom. Continuing Fucking to serve. It. Continuing to give back. It. And absolutely. John Wayne Troxel, thanks for joining the show today. It was absolutely incredible having you on, man. Uh, is there any last thing you want to tell the audience? Real well, quick? Christian and Dave, I want to say thank you both for your uh, service to your country and what you guys are doing now. Um, and to the people out there, especially those that are in uniform, the key thing you got to focus on every day is being able to fight and win our nation's wars and protecting our freedom, our homeland, and our way of life. Never forget that. Boom. Love it. Mm. Come here. Give me a kiss. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Oh, that's great. <laughs>